Father, we thank you this morning for just the opportunity to worship you so freely. And God, we thank you that you are moving in our midst, Lord, that you are doing thing, things in each of our hearts. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you would bring the word to life today. Father, that you would bring revelation to each one of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, once again, as is quite typical, we had an interesting <laughs> morning so far. What, and what was the one phrase that started getting repeated? There is no one like you. How many times did we repeat that? Lots. <laughs> Lots and lots. And there can be a reason for that. You know, even, even in the Word of God in Psalm 136, there is one line, and then there's a repetition, or then there's another line, and that second line gets repeated 26 times. There's one line, and they're all the first line in, in these are all different. And then it gets repeated, his faithful love endures forever, 26 times. So if you, because these psalms are songs, right? So if you sing that song one time through, you're repeating the same thing 26 times. If you sing the song twice, you're singing it 52 times. And it's really interesting because you know it doesn't often happen the exact same way none of our services obviously are are the same but the first thought that I had down on my notes was this I know for myself that when that there are times when I'm reading the Bible and not necessarily paying attention to the repetition that sometimes used And repetition is important. It's there for a reason. It was there for a reason during worship. It's there for a reason in the Word of God. And it signifies that something is very important. So when we're saying over and over and over again, there is no one like you, sometimes it might take us 30 times. If we can focus in, it might take us 30 times to actually get a grip on hey, there is no one like you, God. So try not to get distracted through repetition. Don't get critical. Well, let's move on already. Like, yeah, we know there's no one like God. No. <laughs> we, there is no one like God. And that's all right. Repetition is good. One of the phrases that both Paul, uh, Jesus and Paul used in the, in the New Testament numerous times is, take heed. Take heed. And depending on the translation that you're using and uh, which verse it is, it, sometimes they translate it slightly differently. Sometimes it may use the words, watch out. But when God tells us to take heed or to watch out, it is definitely time to pay extremely close attention to what he's referring to. Otherwise, James 1.22 says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Hearing something is never enough. Ever. Reading something is never enough. A warning does us absolutely no good at all unless we act on it. So we talked about that two weeks ago when we processed the prophetic word from Apostle Dion from Ruach Church in Calgary. And there are many, many warnings in the New Testament to watch against being deceived. Almost every passage in the New Testament that relates to the end of the age contains some type of warning along that line. Watch out. Take heed that you don't be deceived, that you're not deceived. 
So in Matthew 24, Jesus was asked, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? When he began to answer, the very first thing that he said to his disciples was a warning against being deceived. Here it is, Matthew 24, verse 3. As Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Again, we're, you know, we're living in, in 2024. We're in North America. We are not in the Middle East back in the time of Jesus, obviously. So it, sometimes we can get sidetracked and, and not understand the context, what was going on here. The Jewish people were waiting for their Messiah. They were waiting for the Savior to come. There are more than 300 Old Testament prophecies foretelling some aspect of God sending a Savior. And I know I've talked about this before as well, but one, the odds of one man, I, uh, one, they've, somebody's crunched the numbers there, the odds of one man fulfilling 48 of the prophecies is one in 10 followed by 157 zeros. Do you know how big of a number that is? Big. It's big. 157 zeros. Scientists have estimated that the approximate number of atoms in the entire universe is 10 with 80 behind it. <laughs> it's, it's a really big number. Jesus fulfilled, and that's only 48, Jesus fulfilled all 300, more than 300. So there were so many prophecies that the Jewish people had that they were on the lookout for the Messiah. They were watching. So how could they miss it? They're looking for the Messiah. They've got all these prophecies that tell different aspects of what the Messiah is going to look like when he comes. And yet they, you know, so many of them still missed it. How could they do that? I mean, we see it, right? <laughs> Since we got our Bible and, it, and it's you know, condensed for us. It's a lot easier. They were trying to fit the prophecies into their own thinking instead of thinking like God. So they were, they had their mindset going that, okay, this is the way the Messiah is going to come looking like this. And that wasn't exactly how it, how it was. And the devil isn't stupid about this sort of thing. So According to the Jewish Encyclopedia, he sent about 40 false messiahs since the time of Jesus, and all of them have succeeded in deceiving some people. Later on in Matthew 24, verse 23, it says, If anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So a couple of things here. According to Jesus, miracles, signs, and wonders by themselves do not necessarily prove that a message is true. Jesus says straight out, they will show great signs and wonders, but they're actually deceivers. Now, there's no doubt that miracles, signs, and wonders are awesome. They are great if they happen to us when we need them, but they are not to be our basis for truth. That is not what God says. As clever as we are, Jesus said even the elect would be deceived if it were possible. Well, who's the elect? Us, believers. So our safety is not in how clever we are or how spiritual we may think we are. Our safety is in God who reveals truth to us. And these days, plenty of people think that there are any number of truths. I have my truth. Well, you know what's true for me. You have your, your truth, what's true for you. Somebody else has a, a different truth. All of which, of course, is nonsense. 
the definition of truth is that which is true or in accordance with fact or reality. Just because I might decide that 1 plus 4 equals 91 doesn't make it true. I can believe it for all I'm worth. I can shout it from the housetops and 1 plus 4 is 91. It maybe used to be something different, but it's 91 now. It doesn't matter how many times I, I proclaim that. It is not true. God alone is truth. John 15, verse 26, it says, When the Helper, comfort, Comforter, Advocate, Intercessor, Counselor, Strengthener, Standby comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of Truth who comes from the Father, he will testify and bear witness to me. John chapter 18, verse 33, this is actually an interesting little trivia thing here. I'll stop and give you some trivia. You'll always remember this. This was the passage of scripture that I preached for my very first sermon. What is truth? <laughs> very exciting. Downtown Lethbridge in a, a I know I'd, I'd taught in lots of other settings and that, but it, kind of first formal sermon anyway. Downtown Lethbridge at a place called Streets Alive, an outreach ministry. Anyway, John 18, verse 33. Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? Pilate had no idea what truth is, and in fact, most people are like that. In order to take heed and avoid deception, we must be able to identify the truth. And part of the purpose of Jesus' birth was to declare the truth of God. We don't know for sure, you know, you can read things different ways, we don't know for sure whether Pilate was cynical, like, <laughs> what is truth? Or if he was genuinely puzzled, what is truth? But his question was legitimate. We need to know the truth. Not what we want to be truth. Not what somebody else declares is truth. We need to know the truth, and there is only one. Fortunately, in his word, God gives us answers to discovering truth. So to be sure that we have truth, we have to check three boxes. These are three key things. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So first of all, Jesus is the truth. If we are not completely familiar with Jesus, we are in trouble right off the bat. So how do we get to know Jesus? Read the Bible. Read the Word of God. Absolutely. In John 17, Jesus was praying to the Father and he said, John 17, verse 17, teach them your word, which is truth. So God's word is the truth. Read the word. Then, in John, then John says in, in 1 John 5, verse 6, Jesus Christ was revealed as God's son by his baptism in water and by shedding his blood on the cross, not by water only, but by water and blood. And the spirit, who is truth, confirms it with his testimony. So the Holy Spirit is the truth. 
So the truth is Jesus, the truth is the Bible, truth is the Holy Spirit. And in order to know that we really have the truth, we need to look to all three. In the past 50 years or so, I'm sure it's been going on, you know, for hundreds and probably thousand, two thousand years here, but in the past 50 years anyway, there's been a lot more of this sort of thing. People have written a number of kind of pseudo-religious books about who Jesus was, some coming away with the idea that he was just a misunderstood teacher, pointed everyone towards being kind and loving one another, doing our best to get along with everyone. So yesterday, we, there's a, there's a uh, website called BookBub, and if you subscribe to it, it's free. They will send you an email every single day and give you an opportunity to get uh, to pay for a few ebooks at really cheap prices, like a ninety-nine cents or a buck ninety-nine. Some of them are free, and there's some really good books in there. Yesterday, I got an email <laughs> to buy a book called. The Jesus Papers by Michael Bajent. It's Is it possible that Jesus actually survived the crucifixion, going on to marry and found a holy bloodline, one that could have survived into this present day? This provocative New York Times best-selling examination of the origins of Christianity challenges everything we thought we knew about the life and death of Jesus Christ. What a deal. I could have got that book yesterday for a buck ninety-nine. I only had to spend two dollars to read deceptive nonsense. Eighteen years ago, the Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown was similar. It sold eighty million copies. It was made into a movie that grossed three quarters of a billion dollars in spite of horrible reviews. But all of these are designed for one purpose, to draw us away from the truth and cause us to question God. Now, fortunately, some other people have done some incredible research, including Lee Strobel, the case for the real Jesus. Today, the traditional picture of Jesus is under an intellectual onslaught from critical scholars, popular historians, TV documentaries, Hollywood movies, best-selling authors, internet bloggers, Muslim debaters, and atheist think tanks. They're capturing the public's imagination with a radical new portrait of Jesus that bears scant resemblance to the picture historically embraced by the church. And he goes on and, and explains all. He's done incredible research into the, you know, how we can know who the real Jesus is. And guess what? It's, it's the Jesus of the Bible. So I guarantee, though, that these books very much appeal to our human desire to dismiss Jesus in order to disregard what he says about sin about holiness, about salvation, and about heaven. When we check our Bible, which is 100% accurate and trustworthy, and that's you know, another lengthy sermon series, I'm sure. When we check our Bible, you know what some of these things say is not what Jesus says at all. It's not Jesus at all. Saying that Jesus was just a great, charismatic teacher is beyond ridiculous. If he was, he certainly would have straightened everyone out before they nailed him to the cross. His followers certainly would have bailed or straightened everyone out before they were killed for their belief. And literally, they were all, except for one, were actually martyred. We need to know what the Word of God actually says and know that it can be trusted. Or somebody may preach a great deal about the Holy Spirit emphasize a, a, you know, an atmosphere of excitement and feelings. But when you check the person's not really teaching the truth about Jesus, what he said about holiness and committing ourselves 100% to God and his word. We can't just have one part that we choose and you know, pick and choose what we like. Some people place a huge emphasis on the truth of Scripture 
and have nothing of the Spirit. So it's just lifeless words. To be sure that we have the truth, we have to have all three, three things in place. Is it true to Jesus? True to the Bible? Does it have the witness of the Holy Spirit? Proper theology is vital. The Corinthian church. How do we know about the Corinthian church? It's in the Bible. Paul wrote two books to them, two letters. First and second Corinthians. You guys are amazing. <laughs> the Corinthian church actually is probably the closest in, in the Bible to what we would describe today as a charismatic church, like ours. They believed in and operated in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The problem was they did so in a very selfish, immature manner. And so that's why Paul was sending them a couple letters to steer them in the right direction. But in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, Paul warns the church against being deceived. Verse 3, I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. You happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach, or a different kind of spirit than the one you received, or a different kind of gospel than the one you believed. We need to take heed, because as humans, we are prone to accept the false if it sounds good. Jesus is not a wise guru. He's the savior of the world and the son of God. Jesus is not a meek, kind, peace-loving teacher who wanders around patting everyone on the head, saying, there, there, don't worry, just be nice to everybody, peace to all. That is not Jesus. The Jesus that doesn't speak about sin never mentions judgment and says that all religions are diff just different roads to the same God is not the real Jesus. Here is a glimpse of who Jesus actually is. John chapter 2, verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, uh-oh, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. Now, we just herded cows, I don't know, two weeks ago. It was awful. It was really hard. So he's driving away the sheep and the oxen, and I'm telling you, I'm, if I'm an owner, I'm freaking out. <laughs> I got them corralled, and you're letting them out. Not good. Anyway, okay. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, poured out the money changer, the changer's money, overturned the tables, and said to those who sold doves, Take away those things. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples re remembered that it was written, Zeal for your host has eaten me up. It would be like going down to the Friday community market with a whip, knocking all of the tables over and whipping the sellers. Now, how well is that going to go over? Not very well. Not very well. That's what was going on, except it was busier than our Friday market. <laughs> this is not good. Uh, Jesus was extremely angry. Like he was furious. That is Jesus. He does not tolerate sin. We need to take heed to all of the Bible, not just the parts we like. Not just the parts that are socially acceptable in 2024. We don't have any say as to what truth is. None. Zero. I don't get to proclaim it. You don't either. God alone declares truth because he is truth. But there are millions of people 
who think that they're okay with letting everything slide in the name of being nice, and they are not taking heed to what God himself says. He, Jesus isn't nice. He is righteous. He is holy. There is a big difference. Yes, we're to be kind to one another. But we have to place it all together. John 5, verse 24, I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message, in other words, those who take heed to what I actually say, and believe in God who sent me, have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. If we need to pay close attention and take heed and watch out that we aren't deceived, how, how can that be? How do we get deceived? The main way is that we're deceived is as old as the world itself. We are deceived through pride. Pride, pride, pride. Ezekiel 28, verse 12. It's talking about Lucifer, talking about Satan. It says, You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and exquisite in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Your clothing was adorned with every precious stone, all beautifully crafted for you, set in the finest gold. They were given to you on the day you were created. He's a created being. I ordained and, and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. You had access to the holy mountain of God and walked among the stones of fire. You were blameless in all you did from the day you were created until the day evil was found in you. Your rich commerce led you to violence and so you sinned. So I banished you in disgrace from the mountain of God. I expelled you, O mighty guardian, from your place among the stones of fire your heart was filled with pride because of your beauty. Your wisdom was corrupted by your love of splendor. Lucifer was beautiful and wise. But that pride in that led him to rebellion and deception. If that could happen to an archangel in heaven, guess what? We need to take heed. We need to be on guard that we're not deceived. We really have to guard against pride in our lives. Proverbs 16, 18, even non-believers know this one. Pride goes before destruction, haughtiness, or in other words, arrogance, before fall. Usually it's kind of said pride goes before fall. We don't really hear much about weird cults anymore. Not lately, I haven't anyway. But they were a big thing in like the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Anyone know much about the Moonies, the Unification Church? Any Moonies here? No. Of course not. <laughs> In his book called The Divine Principle, their leader, Reverend Moon, claims the book was revealed to him over a period of nine years after he says Jesus appeared to him on Easter Sunday in 1936 on a mountainside and asked him to continue the work that he, Jesus, could not finish while he was on earth due to the tragedy of his crucifixion. Moon basically declared himself to be the second coming of Christ, claiming that he was to complete the mission that Jesus failed at. The official name of the, the Unification Church is this, the Holy Spirit Association. So far, sounds good, right? The Holy Spirit Association for the Unification of World Christianity. Kind of sounds half legit anyway, but it's not. In 1994, Moon also declared the church now had a new mission, or another mission, to go along with the other one, that was to bring reconciliation between people of all different religions all together into one, nations and races. The cult has now spread to a hundred countries around the world with a membership of only three, well, it's got three million, but I mean, still, three million people believe that. 1978, this is the first one I kind of remember. I was old enough to remember this back in the late 70s. 
918 members of the People's, Church, People's Temple cult under the leadership of Jim, uh, Jim Jones committed suicide, and some were murdered by fellow cult members, by drinking Kool-Aid laced with cyanide. If you ever heard the, the phrase, they drank the Kool-Aid, this is where it comes from. 1978, 918 members drank the Kool-Aid laced with cyanide. This is after earlier, I, see this part I don't, didn't remember. Earlier that day, cult members had killed a U.S. congressman, the equivalent of an MP here, like a member of parliament. They killed a U.S. congressman and a delegation who had come to investigate allegations of horrific abuse, kidnapping, murder, and other crimes. So they killed this whole delegation, including the congressman, and then committed suicide, and those that didn't want to commit suicide got killed by the other cult members. That is how strong the deception was. Almost a thousand members were willing to commit murder and then commit suicide, believing their leader to be led by God. In the 90s, David Koresh, the leader of the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas, formerly known as Waco, Texas, after this. <laughs> it's actually the home of Dr. Pepper. It's not all bad. It's good. Dr. Pepper, good. Branch Davidians, not good. David Koresh, the leader of the Branch Davidians, declared himself to be a direct descendant of King David and God's chosen final Messiah. In 1993, the FBI raided the cult's compound to, to arrest Koresh and others on rape and child abuse charges. As the raid began, the leaders set the compound on fire, started shooting and stabbing the other cult members, including five kids under the age of 14. 79 people were killed that day, some by suicide, some murdered by fellow members. Now, obviously, these are seriously deranged and deceived people. And the reason that I mention this, these events all have one common link. Each of the members was deceived, and at least initially, into thinking that the group that they were joining was great and leading them towards God. Deception is powerful, and it can overcome regular people with good intentions. These people all started out the same. They were young children, grew up, you know, had lives, and somehow they got into cults. One of the lures of cults is the prideful attraction that by joining them, you are joining an elite group. Pride appeals to people. And most cults and, and false religions teach you that you can achieve immorality or get to heaven if you do all the right things. The Jehovah's Witnesses teach it. The Mormons teach it. Freemasonry teaches it. Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism. It all goes back to the original sin in Genesis 3. The serpent said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be as gods. In other words, you will be like God. Satan's deception typically uses that same type of motivation and we need to take heed and watch out that we don't fall prey to pride or think that we're somehow better christians than others we'd best not be thinking that we're somehow more knowledgeable than previous generations or thinking that our thinking is somehow better than others better than anyone else christianity is not about comparison we read the word of god we listen to God as he speaks to us. We are obedient to what he says and to his direction. It's all about God, not about us and our great wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, 
that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose the things of the world that the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. So we have to really guard against this. Take heed that we don't think God has chosen us because we're so clever or we're so strong or we're so wise. He just needed us. We have to take heed and guard against pride. Yes, we firmly believe in prophecy. Absolutely. Why do we believe in prophecy? Because God does. He speaks. Is it in the word? It's in the word. Absolutely. We firmly believe in interceding and passionately praying for our region, for our province, for our nation. We firmly believe in praying for revival. We believe that we'll see great things as God works through us. We believe we'll see miracles as God works through us. But none of that can be done from an arrogant or a prideful place. It all has to line up to those, those tests of truth. Does it glorify Jesus? Does it line up with the Word of God? Does it operate through the power of the Holy Spirit? Oh, I got some more good stuff here, but you know what? I'm going to stop there. Don't worry. Everybody except some of you that are going to Calgary next week will get it next week. <laughs> You'll listen. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Just not during, not in the morning. All right, we have to know why we believe and know that what we believe is true. We have to have confidence and we can have, that's why books like Lee Strobel's there, the, he's got the case for Christ, case, case for the real Jesus, case for the creator, I don't know, a bunch more. He's got up like about six or seven of them. Case for faith, yeah. There's some good, and it's really, really, really good, good stuff because he has documented researched and and uh, got the experts to tell us why we can have confidence in what we believe in it is so so important all roads do not lead to god jesus is not anything like what that jesus papers book might suggest if you want to find out what jesus is like we have to read the word of god and take all of it, not just parts of it. Yeah, we'll stop there. Father, thank you for all that you've done today. God, we thank you for the power of prayer. God, we thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking to us. And, and God, that you bring truth to us. Thank you, Lord, for revealing your truth. And God, we once again pray, Father, that you would help us to be on our guard against pride. Father, we repent for those times when we thought that we are better than others in any way, through our words, through our actions. God, it's all you. It's never us. But God, we want to declare your truth. We don't want to declare our truth. Father, we want our truth to come straight from you. Nowhere else. So Lord, we ask again today that you would help our, us to renew our minds as we read your word. Holy Spirit, we invite you to speak to us and to reveal your truth. God, we want to take heed. We want to be on guard. We want to watch out for any little deceptive words that the enemy would try to speak to us. God, we want to be so close to you 
that we're not fooled by the counterfeit. So Holy Spirit, we ask, reveal your truth to us this week even as we read your word. And God, we will press into all that you have for us. We will draw close to you. Thank you, Lord. God, we thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us. God, that you are always there for us. God, that when we come to you, you are there. You have an answer. You have your truth. So, Lord, we look forward to hearing from you this week. God, help us to know what our assignment is for this week. What do you have for us, God? And God, as we come close to you, we ask for a revelation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.